So I just recently made a video about the influencer coach epidemic as I called it because as I'm sure some of you have noticed, the coaching industry has really grown in popularity a lot, especially since the pandemic, more people have been working online. Um, and in the previous video, I talked about coaching in general, life coaching, mindset coaching, health coaching, all the different types of coaching, but I have so much to say on the topic that I had to split them up into two videos. So in this video, I'm gonna just kind of focus on business coaches and coach coaches who are like, business coaches who coach other coaches on how to start or improve their coaching businesses. So before I get into that, get into the video, I just wanna make a few quick disclaimers. I'm gonna to try to go through them as quick as I can because I could sit here and make a whole video just on these disclaimers, but to make them go as fast as possible, I'm just gonna like kind of read off of my computer. So I don't think there's any inherent problem with coaching. I know they provide value to people, but that doesn't mean I can't talk about the problematic or shady things that people are doing. Um, I also am using the Merriam-Webster definition of shady, which is of questionable merits, but whenever I use that word, that's what I mean. Um, I don't hate any of the people I talk about ever in any single video, and I also don't think that all or most coaches do the things that I'm going to be talking about in this video, so it's not a statement about the coaching industry as a whole, just these things that these people are doing that I think are problematic, or some of the things aren't necessarily problematic or shady, they're just kind of weird and I wanted to talk about them. Also, I have made the majority of my recent videos about things that I find to be problematic within different things, but some people a few people have been getting the idea that I'm talking about people that I think are scammers or talking about things that I think are scams. I'm not really sure why. If someone could let me know why, that would be great because I can't figure it out. Um, the only time I've ever mentioned scam in a video was about Kong and water, which is a product. I wasn't talking about like people are scammers and I don't think Kong and water is a scam, although what I say in that video probably does make it seem like I think that, so I apologize for that. Um, but I've never talked about somebody who I like in my head secretly think is a scammer and I'm just trying to like implicitly put it into videos that I think these people are scammers. Not at all, okay? Not at all. I am super unlikely to think that something is a scam unless it's like illegal or like there's illegal or fraudulent stuff taking place, which I've really never talked about that. I might think the people I talk about are greedy or selfish or charging too much money for things, but that doesn't equate to them being scammers. Um, I also don't have a problem with sales, marketing, and advertising. I have a problem with shady types of that. I don't have a problem with people charging money for products or services. I have a problem with people charging a ton of money for those things when I think they should be cheaper. It's just opinion. Like a lot of the things I say in my video also are opinion. I'm not trying to make like factually objective videos where everything I say is like just it's just objective, you know? It's a lot of opinion. I try to make that clear. I try to say, this is my opinion, or to me, or I think, etc. I try to insert those into my script a lot, so it's clear that I'm saying my opinion for a lot of the things that I talk about. I hope that's clear, but some people say that, like, my videos are, like, journalism, and I'm like, not really. <laughs> Of course, journalists aren't always like biased, but I'm never gonna sit here and call myself a journalist because it's like, no, I'm not. I'm just talking about my opinion on stuff. And lastly, when I'm talking about somebody, I do try to generally make it obvious that I'm talking about somebody. I'm not trying to like imply that I'm talking about certain people like at later points of the video. If I'm talking, if I say like, some coaches are greedy at three, at the three minute mark, and then at the 330 minute mark, I'm saying like, this specific person did blah 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 and it has nothing to do with them being greedy. Like, just because those are set at the similar times in the video does not mean I'm saying that person is greedy, okay? Like, I'm making it obvious when I start talking to a person and when I'm done talking to a person, I will try my best to do that. Business coaching has a large focus on becoming rich, if I just put it bluntly. And with most industries where many people's main goal is to make a ton of money, it's inevitable that some problematic or shady or even unethical practices will arise and become a factor in the success of many of the more successful ones. Influencer coaches generally don't promote their services as helping people create a comfortable living through their own online businesses. No, it's about making 10,000 US dollar months, six figure years, or becoming multi-million dollar business owners. Coach Coach Brian Mark's Instagram bio says, I've helped 83 online coaches make $10,000 per month. You next? It's not 
I've helped 83 online coaches make a full-time income from ha running an ethical business and charging clients reasonable amounts because they respect them enough to not try to get away with setting their prices as high as possible you next. Because the thing is, it's way easier to make money in shady ways compared to non-shady ways. It shouldn't be hard to figure out how to lie, cheat, and steal your way to making 10k months. Fake it till you make it. Copy other people's content. Learn manipulative sales tactics. Like I'm not saying Brian or anyone else I talk about in the video is promoting those things. I'm just trying to make the point that doing shady things such as those things that I just listed is going to make success a lot easier. But also, just like in MLMs and probably other businesses as well, the ones who are at the top of the coaching industry are going to be more likely to be the ones who are doing those shady things because that's how they got to the top. Not all of them, but some. If I try to make a video where I was finding shadier problematic things that small coaches are doing, like beginners or just ones that aren't making a lot of money, it would be a lot harder. Like that's just unfortunately the way the world works. Doing shady things makes it easier to get ahead. Those who aren't willing to give up their morals to make more money are going to have a little bit more difficult time to make as much money as the ones who will give up their morals or don't have them in the first place. <laughs> like I don't make 10K a month on YouTube, but that's also never been a goal of mine. I make videos for a lot of reasons, but the only one related to money is making enough to pay my bills. And thankfully, I, in my opinion, don't have to do anything remotely unethical in order to do that. Um, now, if my goal was to make 10K, and that was like my main drive for making videos, I honestly don't think I would struggle to do that because I could just make really lazy content that doesn't take a lot of time to research, film or edit, make stuff about really trendy topics with clickbait thumbnails and titles. I'd be fake bubbly and super energetic because let's be honest, naturally I'm not the most entertaining person in the world. Um, and then imagine if I sold a course on how to make 10K a month on YouTube and that's what I was telling people to do, but like in a way that made it sound a little bit less bad. That would be ridiculous because anyone can figure out how to do that I just told you in like 20 seconds for free. Thankfully, there are some people whose basically elevator pitch isn't just like, I'll help you get rich, make five figure months, six figure years, money, money, money. Like Ruby Lee's own your hustle mastermind positions you to be unapologetic as you make big income goals and make a big impact with your clients. So that's an improvement because she's not just talking about money. But at the same time, her mastermind says it's for entrepreneurs who want to make consistent 50k months. Who needs to make $50,000 a month? $600,000 a year. In my opinion, like I get the impression that there are a lot of business coaches who get into this industry and genuinely would not be happy with like 100k a year, you know? Like that's a goal for a lot of people. Everyone wants to be like a six-figure business owner, but some of these people that would not be enough for them. Even though like 100K, I'll try to explain this a little bit for those of you who are like outside of the US and have a different currency system. 100K is a lot more than most people make, okay? Like that is a good amount of money for pretty much any anyone unless you have like 12 kids. Some of these people though would not be happy with that. No, they wanna be multi-millionaires. They wanna be really rich and they want people to know they're rich in my opinion. And people try to make it seem less superficial by just regurgitating the same dang money mindset stuff every single online entrepreneur, boss babe, digital nomad says. And at this point, I just don't buy it anymore. It's copy paste. They all say the same exact thing. Money is just a form of energy, blah, blah, blah. It's like, so what? You're still at the end of the day greedy. You still know you want to be rich for superficial reasons. And I really think that they just try to make it seem less superficial because they want to look good in front of their audience. Like, I don't think anyone is going to come on here and be like, yeah, honestly, I am pretty greedy. Like, I just want to be really wealthy and live, be able to live in like a huge mansion and be able to show it off to all my friends and people have people think super highly of me and know that I'm rich. Like, I think we all know that there are people on social media who think like that, but yet who's out here saying that? No one, because people aren't going to admit that they're greedy, yet I, I think there's a lot of greed and selfishness in the coaching industry because it's all about money for a lot of the more successful ones. That's all they talk about all the time, money, money, money. And then 
At the same time, it's like if you criticize them in the way that I'm doing it, they just think you're jealous. And that's one of the most frustrating things I think about um, like myself or other people, anyone providing criticism for something that somebody is doing. If they're making a lot of money, they or their followers, their fans will think you're jealous. And that's just a way of immediately writing off any criticism. Oh, you're just jealous. It's like, no, I, I genuinely think that somebody is doing something that is harmful or is selfish or is problematic and I wanna talk about it. There's a lot of people who make a lot of money that I'm not sitting here making videos about because they're not doing anything problematic. So I'm not just jealous of people because they're rich. <laughs> a lot of people also are gonna think, oh, and I just have a bad money mindset. Like money is freedom. If you think that money doesn't make you happy, like you're wrong. Of course, going from struggling financially to having a comfortable income is going to reduce a lot of stress and just improve overall life satisfaction. And that's great. That's something I wish everyone could have, but it's not like it just keeps going up up and up and up the more money you have the happier you are and billionaires are the happiest people on the planet like you can look it up there's been studies done there's graphs out there um, on like the correlation between income and happiness or life satisfaction but they don't really all come to the same conclusion so I don't really want to like post any graphs in this video because it's like you can go and find another one and it has a different result but generally what they're finding is that it doesn't keep going up and up and up it kind of floors out. I don't know if that's the right word, but like it, it levels out at a certain point. So if you're like making 600K a year from what I've seen, does not mean you're gonna be so much more happy than people who are making 200K a year. Let me know if you found different things online. Um, but especially, I feel like if you're the kind of person that's not gonna be happy making 100K a year, like something that could help most people live a very comfortable life, 100k a year you're not gonna be happy with six with 600k like if you can't be happy with 100k why do you think 600k is gonna make you happy and another thing that i don't think a lot of people think of is like the frustration that's possibly gonna be associated with people trying to achieve making six hundred thousand dollars a year like sorry most people aren't gonna ever get that much and so the frustrated frustration associated with like trying to reach this goal and never being able to make it is probably going to lead to a little bit of a decrease in happiness and life satisfaction. Whereas like just being happy with 80K, 100K, whatever, could make your life a lot better than these people who are striving so hard to make 600K for literally no reason. Like what are you gonna do with that money? Buy a dang yacht? Superficial. All right, rant over. Let's move on to another thing I can rant about. Um, one of the most popular coach coaches is Rachel Bell, who runs Online Coach Academy. Here's something that somebody commented on a video of mine from a while ago. She said, Rachel Bell's program that I personally took teaches coaches how to have their audience agree with every single thing so they can create irresistible offers. To me, this sounds like something called micro commitments. It could be something that's just like similar to it, but it sounds like micro commitments, which is where you basically try to get people to say yes to really easy things like, can I get your email address? Yes. And then you just keep asking them these questions where they say, yes, yes, yes. So then when you finally say, hey, you wanna give me $4,000 for this two month course, they're more likely to say yes. That's what micro commitments is. And I did video chat with a woman who has been involved in the world of coaches. And she told me that she has been told to use micro commitments as well. So I'm not surprised if that's what Rachel Bell is teaching. Um, it's like, I don't, I don't like this because it feels like instead of selling their services to people who are eagerly interested, it just feels like they're trying to use these secretive tactics to get people to be more interested without them being conscious that their decisions are kind of feel like they're being manipulated. In my personal opinion, that's just the feeling it gives me. Um, by the influencer intentionally, so they're more likely to get a sale out of them. And it's like when you're carefully crafting your content to target specific people who you know are considering purchasing you're being coached by you, whatever. That just kind of feels gross. I don't like it. Another thing the person I video chatted with told me is that um, some coaches are told to talk about their audience's pain points as well as their desires and dreams. So they're supposed to like slip things that are like talking about specific people that they've already spoken to. They're supposed to like slip that into the content. So these people who are kind of like on the edge or like on the verge of 
like hiring them they're like kind of thinking about it but they haven't really committed yet they're, they they want to try to make it seem like they are talking in general so it seems authentic but in reality they are talking about specific like one or two or three people and those people they kind of want them to think like oh wow this person is really speaking to me like this relates to me so much maybe i really should be coached by this person maybe this is the universe telling me that i need to hire this person and give them my money when in reality if it was the universe talking to them they'd probably be telling them to stay away so back to rachel bell something that she does that isn't necessarily shady but i just think it's beyond weird maybe some people like don't think anything of it but i think it's strange she uses this acronym that you'll see used by a lot of people who have been in her things who are in her private facebook group if you join it and that is the acronym ica which stands for ideal client avatar from my understanding it's like referring to the type of people who they're trying to target like they're kind of uh, demographic that they're trying to go after which is good like in my opinion it's good to have a niche and focus on helping a certain type of person rather than thinking you can just like help everybody no matter what their struggle is like you know all and you can help all these different people with all these different things and I, th I from what i've seen in her facebook group rachel really does try to encourage people to have a niche so i think that's awesome um but calling them avatars is a little weird like it kind of seems dehumanizing in a way i mean what's wrong with just saying my target audience is or my ideal target audience so you can still have a three letter acronym ita it sounds basically the same as ica like i don't know why that word avatar has to be in there it's it's just kind of odd. Here's an example of someone describing their ICA. Um, she is smart and educated, was raised in a traditional middle-class family. I just imagine this person like on the phone with a potential client, they're just talking and she's like, oh, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, you grew up lower class? <laughs> Sorry, I only work with the middle class, bye. Like what an odd thing. Anyways, she's working a full-time nine to five job, but also wants to have a backup plan, own a business, so that she can have the confidence and stability in her future. She knows that she is here for more than working nine to five for the rest of her life. And that's where I wanna stop and talk about how much online entrepreneurs put down people for working traditional corporate nine to five jobs. And unfortunately, I have to announce to the world in every video I make, that I'm a full-time YouTuber because otherwise people are gonna think I'm stuck in some miserable nine to five and I'm just jealous of everyone who gets to work online. No, I work online too, okay? I can make a whole dang video about putting down people for working nine to fives because it's just so annoying. Here's another example of someone doing that from the Facebook group. My ideal client, at least she doesn't call them an avatar, so I gotta give her that. My ideal client is 20 to 30 year old ambitious women who know they are capable of so much more than working for someone else at a nine to five job. As if that's what like peasants do. I mean, it's like these people think that working for someone else or having a nine to five job are just inherently pitiful ways to live just because they didn't like their nine to five. So therefore everybody who works a nine to five just must be absolutely miserable. I just imagine these people having conversations with others about like their jobs and they're talking to someone who's like, oh yeah, my boss brought in cookies to work today. And they're like, oh my God, you have a boss? Aw, I feel so bad for you. I'm self-employed, I'm an entrepreneur, so like I can't relate because I'm my own boss, yeah. I make like five figure months and like I just, yeah, it's like the best thing ever. But it's like, let me tell you, girl, you deserve so much more than being someone else's employee, okay? If you don't believe me, ask any of my employees, they'll tell you the same thing. Because it's like, a lot of these top be your own boss babes and bros. <laughs> have employees, okay? They have people working for them, but they're not encouraging them to go out and be their own bosses, are they? I'm just so over the people who are putting down nine to fivers every dang day. All these online entrepreneurs, it's like, it's the entrepreneurs who are trying to sell their lifestyle to you that do this because it's like, think of like people who do YouTube like me. Are you ever seeing these people put down nine to fivers? No, because we don't make money trying to sell things to people, trying to sell like our YouTube jobs to people, you know? Like I understand, there are people who don't want to work nine to fives and it's great that 
people are providing them with solutions, but making it out to be like inherently nine to fives are bad, we're having a boss is bad, and those are just, like I said, pitiful, miserable ways to live. Like you deserve so much more than working for someone else. You are made for more than this. It's like, but why, what's wrong with that? What is wrong with that? Like that makes it sound like the people who do that are, I don't know the word. I still haven't thought of the word, but basically what I was trying to say is that you never hear people saying like, oh, you're self-employed, oh, you deserve so much more than that, when there are people who would prefer not to be self-employed or there are people who prefer to have bosses. Like, But these people think that self-employed is inherently better than or more... Um, desirable than working for someone else, having a 9 to 5. They think of them in kind of a black and white way and seemingly fail to realize that there are people who prefer to not be their own bosses. There are people who prefer to have 9 to 5s and have schedules and, um, you know, be able to drive to work every day. It's not like everyone would be better off being their own boss. And another thing is that I think these people also, some of them seem to have like superiority complexes. Just the way they talk about themselves and their job and the lifestyle around their job compared to how they talk about working nine to fives. It's like they really seem to think that they're better than people who work for somebody else. And it's kind, it's super off-putting and it really doesn't make sense to me as someone who's self-employed. I can't relate to that thought or feeling because I feel like, like I said, the, the ones who think this are the ones that are trying to sell their lifestyle. And so it almost seems like something that was once like a selling tactic and still is a selling tactic has become a thought that they've actually adopted because like if, if you ask any YouTubers about this or just people who run their own online Etsy shops, things like that, these people aren't saying these same things and maybe they have the thoughts but aren't saying them because they don't need to sell their lifestyle. I don't know, but it, it just doesn't make any sense. Another thing that I wanted to insert here that I've been thinking about and I wanted to know like, um, people of color, like what are your opinions on these types of like influencers or just people in general it's it's it, it's also kind of like in the hustle culture they use the word slave all the time to refer to like doing a nine to five or having a boss like a really really popular quote is i'd rather hustle 24 7 than slave nine to five don't be a slave to the system and to me it it seems like it's kind of diminishing what actual slavery was com like comparing getting paid to work for somebody, working nine to five to actual slavery. I'm not remotely a fan of it, but let me know your thoughts. Moving on, probably gonna say these people's names wrong, so I apologize, but Hansika Silva is a fitness coach and a business coach who co-founded um, the CE-owned coach with Sarah Safari in a blog post titled Four Ways to Land Consistent High Ticket Clients Every Month Whoever wrote it justifies charging high prices by saying, clients who pay low prices are less likely to do the work necessary to achieve results, which I'm pretty sure is true to an extent. I think I talked about this a little bit in my last video, um, but in my opinion, that doesn't make it right to charge exorbitant amounts of money. In this blog post, they're trying to help people land high ticket clients, which they define as paying at least $1,500 for a 90 day course. So selling a 90 day course for like $1,000 is low ticket and people wouldn't really put in the effort because it's not a lot of money. In my opinion, that just shows how out of touch with reality these people who are making like six, seven figures become because they're they're selling the dream of like making five figure months, whatever. They're selling to people who aren't rich. That's a lot of the people who are attracted to these types of things. I think uh, I, I compare coaching to MLMs a lot because they go hand in hand. There's so many similarities. The people who are attracted to these are not usually rich. To them, a thousand dollars for three months is a lot of money. But see, what I think this is really about, in my opinion, is aside from coaches wanting to make as much money as possible and therefore charging more, um, 
like a $200 90 day course sounds a lot less valuable than a $1,500 one. I honestly haven't done any research for this because I don't care that much, but I do think that we generally see more expensive things as being more valuable than less expensive versions of those things of those things, even if there's no difference in the quality of the product or service. If someone's selling a $1,500 90 day course and they're like confident about it, you know, they're not trying to like justify the price, be like, I know it's expensive. Like if they're confident, people are gonna kind of get the impression that this person is charging this much money because they're really good at what they do. Even if you're the first lead they've ever had. Because another thing some business coaches tell you to do is sell high ticket right from the beginning before you have any experience. On the same blog post from CEO.com that I was just talking about, they say, the best way to create a win-win exchange is to simply create a signature offer that costs no less than $1,500 per package. For example, if you're an online coach, you can charge $1,500 for a 90-day coaching package. By doing this, you are positioning yourself as an expert in your industry and creating an equal energy exchange with a clearly outlined result from your program. So this blog post is targeted at people who are struggling to get clients and they're telling themselves to position themselves as experts in the field. To me, that feels wrong. Like I don't wanna come across somebody who's pretending to be an expert, give them $1,500 and then come to find out that they're a beginner. Unfortunately in life, when you're new to something, you're not an expert, you shouldn't promote yourself as such and therefore deceive the people you're trying to help. A health coach commented on my last video, I think, saying, I had paid a business coach a lot of money to help me start my health coaching business. It was a very vulnerable time for me and to keep a long story short, even after paying a lot of money to work with this person, I soon realized that her idea of me being successful was charging people $3,000 plus dollars for six, a six month coaching program as a new health coach. IIN, the health coaching school she went to, doesn't even recommend us charging those prices as a new coach. When I shared my concerns with this person, they spun it around to claim I had insecurity issues, didn't know my worth, and would get nowhere in my business with that mentality. I wanted to help people not gouge them on prices. And so I can assume that there are quite a few people who are new to the coaching industry who are being persuaded to charge a ton of money um, by coach coaches or mentors or just people telling them that's what they should be doing or if they don't do that then they don't know their worth like ridiculous stuff like that person was saying unfortunately i do think it's probably easier to make more money if you're really good at convincing people that they should be spending a lot of money on you um, but thankfully i think that there are a ton of coaches out there who start coaching for like what coaching should be about, which is helping people rather than just making a ton of money. Next thing I want to talk about, if you're planning on giving money to some sort of coach, please ask about their experience level, okay? You have to be specific too, because a lot of the be your own boss babes and bros will just give you fluff. They'll be like, oh my gosh, girl, yeah, like so many people have gotten just such great results from my courses. It's like, that doesn't tell you anything, okay? Ask how many people they've coached. If they're charging $1,500 for 90 day courses, but they're like, yeah, I've coached four people. You can find someone else, okay? That's ridiculous in my opinion. <laughs> also, I talked about this at a little more length in my last video, but like long-term results are much more valuable than short-term results. So look for those too. Every coach is gonna act like their advice is just absolutely amazing, you know? But I've been contacted by multiple people who have told me that they uh, did a coaching call or a course and they didn't feel that way. For example, this woman said, I paid for a coaching session to grow my channel and it was $100 and completely worthless. She didn't look at my channel ahead of time so she gave me very generic advice which was not what she promoted on Instagram. Someone also emailed me about a coaching call they had done with Jasmine Lipska, somebody who I talked about in my last coaching video and the person said, she gave me some nice advice, but it was rather generic. I could have gotten it off a motivational YouTube video. Someone else emailed me saying that they spent $1,000 on a coach named Anna Bay's course about like law of attraction, money mindset, fashion and dating advice, that kind of stuff. And they say, even though I did find some of the information helpful, I feel like I only purchased this course because I was vulnerable at the time. It was a total waste of money and I now realized I've been scammed. Their opinion, not mine, okay. <laughs> and I do want to quickly emphasize that a lot of the people that I've spoken to, um, who have messaged me or who I've seen their comments online, who have taken coaches courses, did say that they felt like they were very vulnerable when they 
invested in them when they purchased them. That's one of the many similarities between coaching and MLMs. Um, despite their business structures not being the same, so many of the same things that I've been seeing in the coaching industry are things that are very common in MLMs. I don't really know what it means. It's just interesting. That's why I keep bringing it up because it's just so interesting to see all these different correlations between the two things. Many coaches talk about not seeking validation and not listening to other people's opinions of you or what you do. And this is great advice to an extent, but like I would say pretty much all things, a little nuance is helpful. Sometimes it is good to listen to other people's opinions because they have different life experiences than you and therefore they can provide different perspectives that might change your mind, might open you up to a new thought process and can lead to a better outcome. In MLMs, recruiters tell people not to listen to their family and friends telling them not to join the MLM or telling them to leave the MLM because they're just jealous of you. They don't want to see you succeed. They're stuck in the old way of doing things and they don't understand online businesses. When in reality, these people just care about you and don't want to see you lose money. And similarly, I and many others provide criticism for various business practices, not because we're jealous of six-figure boss babes and bros and hate them, it's because we care about offering different perspectives that some people might not have thought of. It can lead to better outcomes for these people and can lead them to making more informed decisions. That doesn't necessarily mean not hiring a coach. It might just mean spending more time researching before you hire someone or going for somebody a little bit cheaper. So that's, that's all I have to say on this topic. I'm just gonna kind of end the video abruptly. Let me know your thoughts below.